This is going to be a quick overview of lipid metabolism, and if you want to know more, I will point you to longer videos. But here's the basics. Lipids, your good old fats. So we're talking about our storage fats, we're talking about triacylglycerols, our tags, we're talking about membrane phospholipids, all these different lipids, various reasons why your cells need lipids, and your cells also, one of the things that they use lipids for is for energy storage. So your fat cells, your adipocytes, and your liver cells, your hepatocytes, they can both make lipids, and they can store those lipids that they make. And then when the rest of the body needs lipids, they can ship those lipids out to the body. We'll talk in a minute about how this is a little complicated because of the hydrophobic nature of lipids, but you're going to be able to send those to other tissues, and then those other tissues are going to be able to take in the lipids and then break down the lipids for energy. We'll talk about that breakdown, which occurs in a process called beta oxidation, and that is happening in the mitochondria for the most part. And when those lipids get broken down, they get broken down kind of two carbons at a time. You just cut off two carbon pieces with this, with the CoA attached. And so you end up with acetyl-CoA because remember what acetyl-CoA looks like. We've got those methyl group, then we got the carbonyl. And so our acetyl-CoA, remember also, we could take that into the TCA. And so the fatty acids get broken down into acetyl-CoA that can enter the TCA if you want to go and make energy from them. Turns out that fatty acids are also made from these two carbon acetyl-CoA pieces. But it's a little complicated because they have to go through this indirect process where they first go through a three carbon intermediate called melanyl-CoA that get pieced together. And so we'll talk about this. That's going to be a reductive process. So remember, oxidative processes are often involved in our catabolisms so or breakdown of stuff. And reductive reactions are often involved in our anabolism, our making of stuff. And we want to keep NAD plus levels high so we can use it for oxidation. And so if we want to use something for a reduction, we typically turn to NADPH. And in fact, lipid synthesis is one of the main uses of NADPH. And remember that NADPH could be produced from your pentose phosphate pathway, as well as by enzymes like malic enzyme. So we'll talk more about the details, not too nitty gritty of the details, but we will talk a little about the lipid synthesis which is happening in the cytoplasm of your liver and your adipocytes. And we'll talk about the breakdown, the beta oxidation, which is happening in the mitochondria of most of your cells. In order to actually get the fatty acids into the mitochondria, we'll have to go through some tricks. And in order to get the acetyl-CoA into the cytoplasm, we'll have to go through some tricks. And so because we can't take acetyl-CoA or things attached to CoA in or out of our mitochondria, we're going to use carnitine, we're going to ship out citrate instead of acetyl-CoA, we're going to be doing these different things, these different tricks, to get the molecules where they're needed and still be able to control things. Speaking of control, we'll talk about the key regulatory points of lipid metabolism. We'll get more into the details, again, only on the surface, but a little into the details of the key regulatory points, so I just want you to keep your eye out for these as we go through. For synthesis, it's going to be acetyl-CoA carboxylase, or ACC, which is going to activate the acetyl-CoA to get incorporated into fatty acids. And then for breakdown, it'll be carnitine acyltransferase 1, CAT1, also known as CPT1, which allows fatty acids into the mitochondria to get broken down. As you might imagine, you don't want to be doing both things at the same time, and so these are going to be reciprocally regulated in the cells that have both of these processes. Even in the cells that don't synthesize the fatty acids, you're still going to want to regulate the breakdown so that you're not breaking down fatty acids more than you need. And one of the reasons why you don't want to just keep breaking down those fatty acids is because they can kind of form these things called ketone bodies, which can travel through the bloodstream and acidify the bloodstream. And they can be good source of fuel for tissues like your brain, which can't just use fatty acids as is. But if you have a buildup of that, they can be bad. And so we'll get to this a little later. Let's start first with just the fundamentals. Let's go back and think about how can we actually get these fats from tissues that make it and store it to tissues that need it. The liver and the adipocytes make fatty acids, store them as triacylglycerols or your tags, and ship them out to other tissues in need. Cells take up fatty acids and not triacylglycerols for use as fuel, but fats as energy are stored as these triacylglycerols. 
In order to use the fatty acids, break down the fatty acids, they need to be cleaved off of the glycerol backbone by enzymes called lipases for uptake and subsequent use. Fatty acids are delivered from liver cells to tissues packaged as tags, bones end up with phospholipids, cholesterol, and other hydrophobic stuff in the interior of a lipid-coated bubbles called lipoproteins. The fatty acids, before they're taken into the cells, they're broken off of the glycerol backbone by lipoprotein lipase on the surface of blood vessels. That was happening when your liver was sending out fatty acids. So your liver was sending them as tags in these lipoproteins. The fatty acids that are delivered from your adipocytes, so your fat cells, are actually delivered as fatty acids, not on lipoproteins. But because fatty acids aren't water soluble, unlike those ketone bodies, they're going to have to travel kind of piggybacking on proteins, typically your serum albumin protein, which kind of just has these globby hydrophobic surfaces that can glob onto fatty acids, as well as bind non-specifically to various drugs and stuff, which can sometimes like slow the uptake of various drugs, can sometimes be good, can sometimes be bad. These fatty acids then can travel through your, your bloodstream and reach tissues. They don't need to be cleaved off because they were already cleaved off inside of your adipocytes. So how are your adipocytes going to cleave them off? That's going to happen intracellularly by hormone-sensitive lipase. The hormone-sensitive lipase is sensitive to the hormones adrenaline and glucagon. So if you have low blood sugar, if you have low energy, your fat cells are going to, that's going to activate the hormone-sensitive lipase, break down the fats, send those fatty acids out into the bloodstream where they can bind to the cerebrobumin and be taken to cells in need. This helps us mobilize fuel stores for breakdown for energy inside of the shell or the shipping out into other cells. Fatty acid breakdown occurs in most tissues and takes place mostly in the mitochondria in a process called beta oxidation. Very long fatty acids, so like greater than 20 carbons, are initially broken down via hydrogen peroxide mediated process and peroxisomes. But once they get to a shorter fatty acid, then those can be broken down in the mitochondria as well. So beta oxidation, as the name suggests, this is going to be an oxidation reaction. And so we're going to need an oxidant. We're going to need molecule or molecules that can take electrons. If we look at what we're trying to get to, basically what we want to do is we want to make it so that we can cut off the CoA and still have this acyl-CoA here. So we want to introduce a carbonyl here, and that's going to require two oxidizing equivalents because we're basically going to need to make it an alcohol, which would take one, and then we're going to need to make it a carbonyl, which would take two. And well, actually, instead of the alcohol making one, using one, it's kind of first we make a double bond, and then we hydrate that. But overall, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using FAD in order to introduce a double bond. So now we can add water. And we can add water to this carbon here, which is going to then allow us to form a double bond to the oxygen. And so we're forming more bonds to this oxygen. We're losing this bond to the hydrogen. The carbon's having more electrons stolen away from it. This is an oxidation. And in the process, we've made it so that if we have another CoA come in and attack this carbonyl, now you can kick off a CoA and you still have this acyl-CoA. It's now two carbons shorter but it's still this acyl-CoA. So we've got this acyl and then the rest of the chain, and then we've broken off an acetyl-CoA. And this last enzyme that does this is thiolase. And so this will come into play when we talk about ketone bodies because this can actually be reversible. If you have a lot of these CoA, acetyl-CoA build up, they can come together and form ketone bodies. If you imagine if it even chain fatty acid, you cut it and cut it and cut it in half each time, eventually you're going to end up with just acetyl-CoA. But if you think about an odd chain fatty acid, now you cut it and cut it and cut it, and you're left with one acetyl-CoA and one propionyl-CoA, which is that three carbon intermediate, which can get tr transformed into succinyl-CoA, which can then enter the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And this can be used to replenish the pathway intermediates if you were to go, say, and take malate out to make oxaloacetate to make glucose. So that's why these odd chain fatty acids are glucogenic, as opposed to just our even chain fatty acids, which when you cut them in half and half and half and half and half, you only end up with acetyl-CoA, which can't enter the pathway unless there's already oxaloacetate to join with. You lose two carbons per turn of the cycle, so we've got to put in more than two carbons if we want to take stuff out of the cycle. Before we can actually do beta oxidation, you have to invest some energy and sneak those fatty acids into the mitochondria. The activation happens through fatty acyl-CoA synthetase, or ligase, is ACS, 
what it does is it's going to spend ATP, the equivalent to spending two ATP, in order to attach a CoA to your fatty acid. That leaves you with the fatty acyl CoA. That fatty acyl CoA is a starting material for beta oxidation, but that beta, that beta oxidation happens in the mitochondria and we're still in the cytoplasm. So we're gonna have to go through some trickery in order to bring it in. We're basically going to use this carnitine shuttle where the fatty acid still in the cytoplasm is handed from CoA to carnitine by carnitine acyl transferase one, our cat one, that key regulatory step. The fatty acid now attached to carnitine is then transported into the mitochondrial matrix by carnitine acyl carnitine translocases, which also brings the carnitine back to the cytoplasm. Once you are in your mitochondria, now we can reverse the situation using CAT2, and the fatty acyl CoA can now be broken down by beta oxidation. So we have this activation, attach a CoA, swap that CoA for a carnitine, bring that in, bring that through, convert it back to our fatty acyl CoA, and now we're ready for beta oxidation. That beta oxidation would generate a lot of acetyl CoA. If that acetyl CoA can enter the TCA, all is great. If it can't, however, it builds up. And that last step of beta oxidation, that thiolase step reverses itself, followed by a couple of other enzymatic steps that results in the formation of ketone bodies. This can happen in the case of diabetes if there's not enough oxaloacetate to keep the TCA running. It can happen in the case of ethanol intoxication because the NADH builds up from ethanol oxidation and inhibits the TCA. Or it can happen in starvation because you don't have enough oxaloacetate and you have excessive breakdown of ketogenic amino acids. What can happen if you have a lot of ketone body formation is that it can acidify the bloodstream causing a condition called ketoacidosis. But before you get away thinking that all ketone bodies are bad, they're really important for your brain because since they're soluble, they can go through like the blood-brain barrier, whereas your lipids, your fatty acids that are traveling through your bloodstream on like serum proteins, those can't actually get to your brain readily. So ketone bodies are able to offer a quicker source of fuel for your brain allowing it to have energy to keep going under conditions where glucose is low. Your brain can't like store glycogen and stuff, so it really relies on those ketone bodies if it needs energy. And those ketone bodies can also be formed, say, from some amino acids. Fatty acids are themselves made from acetyl-CoA. The synthesis of fatty acids occurs mostly in the cytoplasm of liver and fat cells, and is a key user of NADPH, which can be made through the pentose phosphate pathway. I say it mostly happens in the cytoplasm of liver and fat cells. Some of it happens in the mitochondria, but mostly in the cytoplasm. Because acetyl-CoA can't get through the mitochondrial membranes, citrate and not acetyl-CoA is removed from the mitochondria to make fats. It is subsequently broken back down to acetyl-CoA, by ATP citrate lyase. So what we're looking at here, we take citrate out, we convert that um, to oxaloacetate using ATP citrate lyase. Now that you have acetyl-CoA in your cytoplasm, it's going to be pieced together by a multifunctional protein called your fatty acid synthase or FAS. You're going to build two carbons at a time, but you're going to build them from a three carbon intermediate called melanocoA. MelanocoA was made through the ACC step through carboxylation. MelanocoA is kind of the activated form because it has this beta keto acid. Beta keto acids are favorable to decarboxylate, and when they decarboxylate, the energy from that can be used to attack binge onto the growing fatty acid chain. This is a key side of regulation. It's going to be activated by citrate, an example of our feed forward stimulation from allosteric regulation, and inhibited by another type of allosteric regulation, this time feedback inhibition by palmitoyl CoA. For each cycle that we go through, we add two carbons and we use one ATP and two NADPH. The cycle kind of stops by default at 16 carbon saturated fatty acid called palmitate, which is cleaved off by FAS by the thioesterase subunit. Longer fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids can be made via elongation and desaturation on the ER. One note though is that although we can add double bonds, we can't do so past the 910 position in our delta nomenclature. So when we're thinking about counting, starting from the carboxylic acid side, we can't add a double bond past the position between carbons 9 and 10. Practically what this means is that we can't introduce an omega-3 or omega-6 double bond. So omega notation that counts from the other end, so from the alkane end. 
What that's going to mean is that if you want an omega-3 or an omega-6 fatty acid, you're going to have to get that through your diet. You can then modify it to get more complicated and longer and stuff, omega-3 and omega-6. But because when you add, you add to the delta end, not the omega end, the omega position is not going to change when you elongate a fatty acid. And so if you can't introduce that, that bond at that omega-3 or omega-6 position, you can't transform another fatty acid that doesn't have one of those into one of those. So look at the other video if you want to know more about that. But the elongation and the desaturation, that's going to happen in like the membrane of your ER. The synthesis and the breakdown are reciprocally regulated. Melano-CoA itself is going to be an inhibitor of CAT1 or CPT1, which was involved in the fatty acid breakdown. Our ACC is also going to be regulated hormonally through phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. Involving those hormones we see over and over when we're talking about metabolism, our insulin, that signal of kind of high energy, high glucose, that sort of thing, and its kind of counterpart, glucagon, our signal of low energy. And remember, glucagon is often working the same way as epinephrine. Epinephrine, that's our kind of like our stress signal. So if we, we want to break down things for energy, we're going to have glucagon and epinephrine be acting. And if we want to store energy, we want insulin. Well, if you build fatty acids, we want to do that when we want to store energy, when we have a lot of energy. So insulin is going to promote the activation of ACC. And the way that it does it is by activating a phosphatase that dephosphorylates ACC. So what adds the phosphate group, the thing that you want when you want to inhibit the ACC. And so epinephrine and glucagon are able to act through PKA in order to phosphorylate the ACC and inactivate it so that you can use the acetyl-CoA for energy rather than building it up together. Other kinases also like AMPK, your signal of low energy status. In those cases, you're going to want to burn the acetyl-CoA for energy rather than build it up into fatty acids. So we have our covalent modification on top of the allosteric modification. This is going to allow for a more like global regulation, sending signals throughout your body rather than just what's happening in that cell in that moment. So a quick review of our quick overview. The synthesis and breakdown of fatty acids are reciprocally regulated and happening in different locations. We're going to be breaking down fatty acids two carbons at a time. For each cycle, we're going to be cutting off an acetyl-CoA, producing an NADH and an FADH2 that can be used to make ATP. If we have odd-chain fatty acids, that's going to leave us also with the three-carbon propionyl-CoA, which gets converted to succinyl-CoA, which can be used in the TCA. That's going to be an example of an anaplerotic reaction. It can replenish intermediates if we take intermediates out to do things like, say, make glucose. Therefore, we say that odd-chain fatty acids can be glucogenic, so we can make glucose from them, but not the even-chain fatty acids. That doesn't mean that you can't find, say, carbons from your fats in your glucose. It just means that if all you had were fatty acids, they couldn't be used to sustainably make glucose because they can't enter the TCA unless oxaloacetate is already present. And oxaloacetate wouldn't be present on net if for every like acetyl-CoA yeah, you brought in, if you took on a mallet to make glucose, that wouldn't work. Synthesis of fatty acids, that's happening in the cytoplasm. Remember, that's in our liver and our fat cells, and it uses NADPH, which we can make from the pentose phosphate pathway and from malic enzyme. This is mostly happening in your cytoplasm, a little bit in your mitochondria. Citrate, not acetyl-CoA, is removed from the citric acid cycle from the mitochondria in order to make fats and broken back down to acetyl-CoA by ATP citrate lyase. Key regulatory points are for the synthesis, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, or ACC, which activates acetyl-CoA for incorporation. Remember, that was how we made our melano-CoA, and then that melano-CoA was going to inhibit the breakdown. Our key regulatory point for breakdown was carnitine acyltransferase 1, or CAT1, or CPT1, which allows our fatty acids into the mitochondria for breakdown. Remember, that was where we swapped that carnitine on, in place for that CoA, and that was going to allow our fatty acids to enter the mitochondria, where they can be broken down through beta oxidation. So there you have it, a whirlwind tour of our lipid metabolism.